Thank you very much. <coughs> and I think um, and mo most of you are also uh, teachers as well. Uh, today is the uh, teacher, Teacher's Day in uh, Taiwan. So I wish, oh, I wish you all a happy Teacher's Day. Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present to you advances and challenges in PGD and PGS. Um, the first topic uh, uh, discuss extra data reporting on PGD cycles and all site donation. The Extra PGD Consortium actively collects data on PGD and PGS each year. There are several working groups. There are 11 participating centers in the America, uh, 83 centers in Europe, and 28 centers in Africa, Asia, Australia, and Russia. The consortium has analyzed 14 sets of data with indications including the followings. They found that the methods for biopsy has changed. There is a gradual increase in polar body and the blood cell biopsy. And the methods for diagnosis of monogenic PGD are evolving. And the number of PGS cycles has dropped in the last five years, probably because, uh, because of the negative data of the day three cleavage stage uh, biopsy. Uh, several quality standards and accreditation schemes have been initiated, and the misdiagnosed mon monitoring and audit working group has submitted a paper on the data collected on embryo follow-up after amplification-based PGD. The molecular methods working group has developed a primer database for sharing validated primers, and the, the information exchange and education working group ran a successful pilot of webinar-based tools. The next topic is euploid embryos are far more likely to undergo blastulation than aneuploid, and then aneuploid embryos when based on single blastomil array CGH. The question was, is blastulation rate associated with euploid embryo status? Trophectodon biopsy showed a higher rate of euploid embryos at the blastocyst stage than the euploid rate as previously reported from cleavage stage blastomere biopsies. It, it has been thought that aneuploid embryos are just as likely to undergo blastulation as euploid embryos. And this is a retrospective cohort study performed on 44 IVF, IVF cycles. Day 3 single cell blastomere biopsy with array CGH and PGS was performed. The primary objective was to assess the hypothesis that blastulation rate is higher among euploid than aneuploid embryos. As you can see, uh, the blastulation rate is much higher in euploid embryos as compared with the aneuploid embryos. It's about three times greater in euploid embryos. Um, and the embryos that reach fully expanded or hatching blastocysts is also much higher in the euploid embryos as compared with the aneuploid embryos. It's about four times higher. So the authors conclude that euploid embryos appear three times more likely to undergo bacterialization than and euploid embryos. The expansion and hatching rates are higher in euploid embryos. So blastocyst culture is a, 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 a good tool to select uh, euploid embryos for transfer. Uh, the study limitation was that it's a retrospective stu uh, study with st small study group and mosaicism in single cell biopsy could affect the outcomes. The, uh, next topic is pre-implantation genetic screening on day three embryos using array CGH in patients with advanced maternal age. It's a prospective double-blinded randomized control trial. The question was, does cleavage stage PGS using array CGH improve the clinical outcome of IVF techniques in patients of advanced maternal age? 
PGS studies demonstrated a high prevalence of aneuploidy in human embryos. And uh, previously, the fish-based uh, PGS on cleavage stage em embryos failed to improve live birth rate. Uh, the, the fish technolo technology is quite tricky, and that may be the main reason for this uh, poor clinical performance. The primary objective of this study was to assess whether PGS on cleavage stage embryos using array CGH improved the clinical outcome of IVF techniques in patients of advanced maternal age. This is a prospective double-blinded randomized control trial. The inclusion criteria were uh, female patients aged between 36 and 43 years with a history of less than three miscarriage and less than three failed IVF exit cycles and more than four M2 oocyte retrieved. The patients were randomized into two groups. In the control group, ICSI procedure was performed and up to two day five embryos were transferred. In the study group, ICSI was also performed and uh, uh, one cell embryo biopsy was performed on day three, followed by PGS uh, using a ray CGH. And up to euploid embryos were transferred on day five. As, uh, as you can see, in fresh cycles, there is no significant difference between P the PGS group and control group in terms of clinical pregnancy rate per patient, ongoing pregnancy rate per patient, clinical pregnancy rate per ET, and ongoing pregnancy rate per ET. By contrast, the, the implantation rate and ongoing implantation rate is higher in the PGS group as compared with the control group. Notably, there is one miscarriage due to a misdiagnosis in the PGS group. For the accumulative cycles, there is also no significant difference in cumulative pregnancy rate um, per patient ongoing clinical pregnancy rate per patient per ET and ongoing clinical pregnancy rate per ET. Um, similarly, the, the implantation rate and ongoing implantation rate is higher in the PGS uh, group as compared with the control group. So the conclusions were PGS at the cleavage stage improves the implantation rate in patients of advanced maternal age, but it does not increased pregnancy rates per patient. There is a higher risk of misdiagnosis due to mosaicism with than with current blastocyst biopsy strategy. And, and, and this led to the early termination of this study. The, the next topic is, uh, does pre-implantation genetic screening really improve uh, implantation rates? Uh, they compare the frozen salt embryo transfer between patients uh, undergoing uh, PGS or without PGS. The question was, is PGS a real improvement? The implantation rates of frozen salt embryo replacement cycles of patients undergoing PGS using array CGH were compared with those uh, FET cycles without PGS. There are several uh, reports that PGS improves clinical outcomes. The majority of these make, com make the comparison between frozen salt PGF cycles and the fresh cycles without PGS. This is quite weird. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think this comparison is inappropriate because uh, evidence during the past years have, have reported equal or even higher pregnancy rates of FETs uh, cycles compared, uh, uh, compared with the fresh cycles. I, I have asked this question in the SI meeting last year to the, to the Colorado uh, groups, uh, but they, they, they don't have good explanation. Why, 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 do they, why do they do PGS in the FET cycle and uh, the, the control group uh, in the fresh cycle? They, this, this is not fair. 
And uh, this study is a retrospective core study. Uh, they examine all FM and frozen thought embryo replacement cycles performed in a single center. All, all the embryos were at the blastocyst stage and array CGH was used. After thawing, embryos were cultured to, for two to four hours to assess embryo viability before they were transferred. Only single embryo transfer were made in the PGS cycles. Um, and as you can see, there is, there is no uh, significant difference uh, between cycles with or without PGS in terms of clinical pregnancy rate and accumulated pregnancy rate. Um, uh, by, by contrast, the ongoing, pregnancy, the ongoing implantation rate is higher in uh, FET cycles with PGS than with, uh, without PGS. So a significantly higher implantation rate was observed in uh, frozen thought PGS cycles than in frozen thought cycles not undergoing PGS. So uh, the conclusions were transferring euploid embryos significantly increases the chances of implantation even when performing SET, uh, thereby lowering, lowering the risk of twin pregnancies. Th and these results demonstrate that selecting euploid embryos for transfer improves the chance of achieving a pregnancy. The study limitation is that the number of the patients was limited and the number the, and the embryos transferred in frozen salt cycles were often not morphologically op optimal since the good ones were already chosen for fresh cycles. So this is the major drawback of this study. Uh, the next topic is, is cohort size of euploid blastocysts following CCS predicted of improved outcomes in single embryo transfer cycles? The question was, can the quantity of euploid blastocysts in a given cohort be used to identify the best candidates for set while maintaining a high clinical pregnancy rate and reducing the risk of multiple pregnancy? In the United States, 88% of ART cycles involve transfer of two or more embryos, resulting in a multiple pregnancy rate of 20 27.5%. And uh, the trophectoderm biopsy followed by CCS is superior to morphological assessment in identifying embryos for set. Um, however, no study has examined so far whether the, the number of euploid embryos is in a cohort is associated with improved outcome following set. This is a multi-center retrospective analysis. Uh, a total of 297 patients referred for CCS underwent SET or DET after confirmation of at least one euploid embryos. And the followings are the most common diagnosis. And the number of euploid blastocysts produced was recorded, and the study outcomes included clinical pregnancy rate and multiple gestation rate. And for patients with three or less euploid blastocysts, the clinical pregnancy rate is significantly higher for patients receiving double embryo transfer as compared with single embryo transfer. However, the multiple gestation rate increased from 0 to, 30 to 38%. So in patients with three or less euploid blastocysts, Double embryo transfer increases the pregnancy rate, but also increases the risk of multiple pregnancy. For patients with four or more euploid blastocysts, there is no, clinic, no statistical difference uh, in terms of clinical pregnancy rate between single and double embryo transfer. And, however, the multiple uh, gestation rate is about five times, uh, five-fold higher in patients receiving double embryo transfer. So the, the authors conclude that patients who produce three or less M euploid blood sources are more likely to achieve pregnancy with double embryo tr transfer. However, the risk of re multiple pregnancy is mu much higher. For patients who produce four or more euploid blood sources are just as likely to achieve pregnancy 
with set as with dead. However, the, the risk of multiple pregnancy is five times higher with dead. The authors conclude that patients who produce at least four euploid embryos are good candidates for set, since the results of set and dead are almost the same. And the next, the next session is uh, the, the, uh, discuss reanalysis of whole day five embryos using the same array CGH platform used for single cell day three biopsy showed a high confirmation rate. The question was, is day three PGS by array CGH representative of the whole embryo regarding concordance between day three single cell analysis and day five real analysis of the whole embryo using the same array CGH platform? And as we all know, meiotic or mitotic errors during embryo development lead to embryo aneuploidies. And uh, mosaicism has been observed both at both cleavage and the uh, blastocyst stage. It has been widely discussed that day three embryo biopsy could not have a role in PGS because it, it is not representative of uh, the whole um, embryo. This is a prospective blinded study to reanalyze embryos previously diagno diagnosed as chromosomally abnormal by day three array CGH using day five array CGH of the whole embryo. And the result of day three and day five were compared using the same protocol. A total of 50 embryos were analyzed. In, in, in these uh, 50 embryos diagnosed as chromosomally abnormal uh, on day three, 49 were also diagnosed as chromosomally abnormal on day five. So the confirmation rate between day three biopsy and day five whole embryo analysis was quite high. There is one um, discordance um, um, between day three and day five results. Uh, in this em embryo, uh, the, the day three array CGH uh, was di diagnosed as monosomy 18. But uh, in day five array CGH, it was diagnosed as euploidy. Um, in fact, and it's a mosaic embryo with monosomy 18 plus normal cells. So day three array CGH diagnosis is highly confirmed by day five reanalysis of the whole embryo using the same protocol. The high confirmation rate suggests that day three diagnosis is representative of the whole embryo. An accurate diagnosis for PGS can thus be performed with day three array CGH. Uh, the study limitation was that uh, low level of mosaicism, less than 25 to 30%, cannot be detected by array CGH on day five biopsies. The next uh, topic discuss non-reciprocal non -re errors and germinal mosaicism detected by the application of array CGH to oocyte and polar bodies unexposed to sperm. The question was, in women of average maternal age, what is the instance of chromosome versus chromatid anomalies in all genesis? And how common are non-reciprocal errors? And how common is germinal mosaicism? Two predominant aneuploidy causing mechanisms have been shown to exist in female meiosis. It's whole chromosome non-disjunction and premature separation of chromatids. And array CGH testing of polar bodies have shown that in women of advanced maternal age, most anomalies are due to premature separation of chromatids. And previous research using different techniques gave more mixed results. Polar body test testing has been shown to be the least reliable technique as compared with blastomere or trof to factor them biopsy. In this study, 89 unfertilized, unfertilized eggs uh, at different stages from GV to M2 um, were obtained, uh, in, in which 80, 84 gave re results. The all sites were analyzed by whole genome amplification and array CGH. In the 28 metaphase two polar body complexes, 
14 were diagnosed as euploid, and another 14 were diagnosed as aneuploidy. And then nine of the, the 14 aneuploid uh, are reciprocal errors, and another five is non-reciprocal errors. As you can see, most errors are chromatid errors. Only a few are uh, chromosome errors. So chromatid abnormalities are more common than chromosome abnormalities in unfertilized fer oocytes. Um, for the uh, 17 GV oocytes, all were euploid. And in the 21M1 oocyte, 18 were euploid, and three were aneuploid. Two, uh, two of them had chromo chromatid errors, and the other one had chromosome errors. So the authors conclude that chromatid abnormalities are more common than chromosome abnormalities in unfertilized eggs. The overall aneuploid rate of all oocytes across all stages is about 27%, in which 60% had chromatid errors, 17% had chromosome errors, and 13% had both errors. Also, non-reciprocal errors and germinal mosaicism had been detected in these oocytes. The final topic uh, discussed uh, the effect of chromosome polymorphic variants on infertility and uh, the relationship with IVF cycle outcome. The question was, is there a correlation between chromosome polymorphic variants and the infertile phenotype? Is, is there an association with IVF cycle outcome? Uh, as we all know, structural chromosome anomalies are a common genetic failure in humans and are responsible for uh, infertility and the recurrent pregnancy loss. And the polymorphic variants on chromosomes in, involving heterochromatic regions appear to occur in the general population without clinical significance. However, the instance of these variants is higher in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss and men with poor sperm quality. In this study, uh, cytogenetic analysis was performed on about 800 infertile patients and about 600 sperm and, don don uh, sperm and oocyte donors. And also the rate of aneuploid spermatozoa uh, was uh, analyzed using fish in uh, 145 infertile men. And the outcome of IVF cycles was also analyzed to uh, compare uh, the outcome between uh, patients with or without polymorphism. The main cycle outcome measures were biochemical and clinical miscarriage rates. The, the frequency of the polymorphic variants are higher, uh, is higher uh, in patients with a history of infertility as compared with uh, the control group. And also, the frequency of variants among patients with uh, recurrent pregnancy loss was higher than uh, that in controls. It's about 24.1% uh, it's about versus 12.8%. Uh, As for individual uh, polymorphic variants, there is a statistical significance uh, uh, only in 9QH9 plus and uh, uh, YQH plus. So chromosome polymorphic variants are more prevalent in infertile than the control group, especially in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. And significant differences were observed in rate of aneuploid embryos between infertile men with and without polymorphism. For men with polymorphism, the aneuploid rate is 37.7%. For men without polymorphism, the aneuploid rate is 16.3%. And the sperm count was unaffected. So men carrying polymorphism have a higher instance of sperm aneuploidies. As regards 
IVF outcomes between groups of patients without uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, there is no uh, significant difference between patients carrying uh, with or without polymorphism in terms of fertilization rate, implantation rate, and good embryo rate and uh, pregnancy rate. There is a trend uh, uh, for uh, higher biochemical miscarriage rate and uh, clinical miscarriage rate in patients in patients carrying polymorphism, but it does not reach statistical significance. So the authors uh, think that patients with polymorphism and undergoing an IVF cycle appear to be at a higher risk of miscarriage, but, it, but this is not statistically significant. So uh, the conclusions were chromosome polymorphic variants are more prevalent in the, in the infertile population than normal controls. Sperm aneuploidy rates are higher in men with polymorphism, and patients with polymorphism appear to be more likely to suffer from pregnancy loss after IVF. Finally, uh, chromosome polymorphic variants are associated with infertility in both men and women and should be considered before fertility treatment. However, the, the exact role of these uh, polymorphic variants in infertility remain to be uh, investigated. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Yeah, a very nice presentation for PGD and PGS. As we all know that PGD, PGS session is one of its part for Asia meeting. Hedicide report is a PG. Uh, based in 1990, right? So this session is open for question or comment. Is that only question or comment? Flow? Yeah. Thanks for your lecture. And uh, the mosaicism in, in the cleavage stage embryo is a big concern to, uh, when we perform the cleavage biopsy. But in the data is shown the, the consistency between the uh, day three blastomial biopsy and the final uh, confirmation from the uh, blastocyst. Uh, how about the percentage you, you have shown? Is 90% or 80% consistency? Uh, the consistency is about, uh, um, in, 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 the 50, in the 50 embryos uh, diagnosed as abnormal, and, th and there is 49, 49 diagnosed, also diagnosed as abnormal. In, uh, in, the, uh, in the day five. Um, and, uh, but these, these are only uh, abnormal em embryos. Since the, the normal embryos have been transferred, they, they, they can only use the aneuploidy embryos for research. Yeah, so it's almost 89, <laughs> 98%. Yeah, okay, can, uh, go, can I go back to the slides? Can we take it back to the slide? Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, uh, in, in, in a total of 50 em embryos diagnosed as abnormal, 49 also were diagnosed as abnormal, in, in which 74% were exactly the same, and 12% had, had at least one day three aneuploidy, and 8% had at least one aneuploidy and or complementary monosomy or trisomy, and 4% have all day three anomaly. <coughs> Uh, abnormalities plus uh, new monosomy on day five. So, so the uh, confirmation rate is very high. So wh what is your opinion to do the day three biopsy is okay or not? Uh, since this is only a small group, 
and, and we, we, uh, without testing on the euploid and embryos on day, day three. Uh, so it needs further stu uh, uh, studies. Uh, this is too good to be true. <laughs> well, the second question is, the, how do you define the polymorphism from cytogenetic study? This is from cytogenetic. Yeah, cytogenetic. So how to define the polymorphism of uh, chromosome? Uh, and in, 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 in fact, I, I am not an expert on cytogenetics. Okay. I, have, I have an ex as the cytogenetic um, doctors at, uh, at our uh, hospital. He told me that uh, these polymorphic um, um, uh, variants uh, are of no clinical uh, significance, and uh, uh, kind of inversion or elongation of the heterochromatin, which, is, uh, which has no impact on the, on the health of the in individual. Uh, but th there are some, stu some studies that these variants uh, have a role in infertility. The, the instance is higher uh, in patients with infertility. Yeah. Okay, if none, uh, we will uh, give our great thanks to the Professor Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you.